Good morning, I'm Sarah Bonides. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Jose Cuevas. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about over the next hour. You is gearing up for spring break. We have your top 10 best destinations to escape the cold. A weekly event on campus is being recognized for celebrating diversity of thought and religion. By women for women. See how one student is seeking to transform women's health. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Our top story this hour, students are gearing up for spring break here on the Hill. While some students are traveling abroad or going to the beach to escape the snow, some students are staying on campus. Our Zach Satan joins us live to tell us how those students plan to keep busy. Jose, Sarah, thank you very much. I am live here on the quad and students are starting to head to classes right now, but in a couple days they'll be heading away for a much deserved break. So it'll be a little bit quieter here on campus, except for a few others who are sticking around, whether it be for work, financial reasons, or they're helping with student organizations here on campus. And they're still deciding what they can do while it's a little bit of a calmer week. Your students are excited to get away from the mountains of the snow and into the warmth of the sun. Some will head to beaches, some to big cities. Others may be going to foreign countries for school projects. I'm excited to say I'll also be traveling to Israel with Isha and Dean Kaplan next month. But for a few, they'll have to keep the boots on and trek through the snow at least one more week. Uh, instead of kind of taking that time to spend more money, I decided to stay in town and try to make some. My parents are coming up like in two months, so they thought it would be better if we just waited until then to um, all see each other. According to Statista, 6% of students stayed on college campuses last year during spring break. Which leaves the question, what do universities provide while they're still here? Food options for SU are limited. The only places staying open being the dining hall in Shine Student Center and a cafe in Eggers Hall. I think the limited options hurt students, uh, especially those that live on campus that don't have their own kitchens or microwaves or stoves and things. Working out will be a little more convenient with gyms such as Syracuse University Fitness Center on Marshall Street and the Fitness Center in Ernie Davis Hall are open. But mainly, they'll probably use the week to just relax, maybe even do some spring cleaning. And also take some time to clean our house. <laughs> it's in need of, of a nice sweep and mop downstairs from all the mud and snow that gets tracked inside. And Now, there will be some options for students to do campus. There are lacrosse games inside the Carrier Dome over the weekend, along with some plays showing at Syracuse stage. We also may have potential for basketball over the next week if Syracuse plays in the NIT. We'll have much more on that in the sports segment later on in the show. Reporting live from the quad, I'm Zach Staten for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks, Zach. Many of us are counting down the days until spring break. Some students are looking forward to winter weather fun, while others are looking to spend some time in the sun. We're going to go skiing for like three days. We're going to Punta Cana for five days, so we're super excited to be on the beach and just relax. Yeah. If you're looking to trade in the snow for the sand, you definitely won't be alone. U.S. News released a list of the top 10 best spring break getaways for 2018. The destinations were ranked based on affordability, accessibility, and popularity, and included places like Cancun, Miami Beach, Punta Cana, and more. Time to check your weather for today. A snowstorm is moving into the northeast. How much snow could we be getting? Gianna Asterito is live to tell us what to expect. Thanks, guys. So I have some good news and I have some bad news. The bad news is that there's a nor'easter coming, but the good news is that it's going to just miss us here in central New York. The nor'easter is supposed to go downstate towards Philadelphia, so if you're planning to go there sometime this weekend, make sure you plan accordingly because you don't want to get stuck in that storm. Um, it's, currently 60, it's currently 36 degrees, as you can see. It's pretty cold out here, but not too bad. So let's check out what we have going on for the rest of the week. Starting with today, it's generally overcast with periods of light snow and snow showers with a high of 36 degrees and a low of 28. Expect steadier and heavier snow developing in the east and southeast as the day progresses. Tomorrow and again, minor snow showers for central New York with a high of 34 degrees and a low of 28. The wind will be picking up, so make sure you're bundling up before going outside. Moving on to Friday, we're expecting about one to three inches of snow here in Onondaga County. Temperatures are staying in the low to mid 30s with a high of 33 and a low of 27. Along with the winds, we're also likely to see some rain on Friday, so be aware of that. 
Saturday temperatures are staying about the same with a high of 33 and a low of 25. We're expected to see some morning snow showers, but also have a 60% chance of rain on Saturday as well. And Sunday, we're reaching a high of 35 and a low of 23, stuck in the mid-30s, but warm enough to stop the snow from falling. It will be partly cloudy, so hopefully the sun will shine through to melt away some of the snow we get throughout the end of the week. And I, speaking of the sun, hopefully you're traveling for spring break. I know that I am, so I'm going to be excited to get away from some of the snow. But since it's going to be partly cloudy, hopefully the sun will peek through on Sunday to melt away some of this snow and the snow that we're supposed to be getting. This has been the, this has been the 10 a.m. weather forecast. I'm Gianna Astorio. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Gianna. As the sun sets on Sunday evenings at Syracuse, you have the opportunity to experience an award-winning service at Hendricks Chapel, the Dean's Convocation. The award is the Outstanding Spiritual Initiatives Award from NASPA, an association of student affairs professionals in higher education. The award is given annually to recognize a program that promotes spiritual and religious growth on a college campus. The Dean's Convocation, which takes place every Sunday at 7 p.m., was chosen for its unique and innovative model, featuring a diversity of religious and philosophical backgrounds, as well as a lively music component. The president of the Hendricks Chapel Choir says the convocation is about much more than a church service. How it's a great experience being at home with everybody. I know that when you come in here, you really feel accepted no matter what religion you are or what you celebrate or whether or not you celebrate anything and it really feels like a warm embrace on every Sunday night. Each week, the Hendricks Chapel Choir, along with other musical guests, help lead the service along with the Hendricks Dean, Brian Conkle. The university has officially kicked off a new initiative to improve communication with student media. The SU Media Relations team will host bi-weekly briefings with members of the student media. The meetings will highlight upcoming goals for the university and include a Q&A session for the students. The first briefing was held last week on Wednesday. Citrus TV reporter Chris Venzon says these meetings can help students find new stories and improve their journalism skills. What it means, what it means for me is that we'll be able to um, just connect better uh, and really be able to just have that communication, like I said. Um, I think it just makes us feel more valued, which is important um, on both sides of the equation. March 21st, the gathering will highlight upcoming goals and events for the remainder of the semester. This is Universal Women's Week, a time to celebrate the contributions of women in society. Our own Sarah Perks is live in the studio to tell us how an SU student is working on an industrial design that will help women feel more comfortable when getting tested for STDs. That's right, SU student Savannah Sears is working on a project that could redesign one area of women's health care. I was able to talk to her about what her plan is and how her idea will directly impact women as a whole. Industrial design major Savannah Sears is working to redesign STD testing for women. After realizing how many sexually active women don't like to get tested or go to the gynecologist, she wants to figure out a way to make women feel more comfortable and independent. I'm making it so that women um, have the option of self-testing when they go to the clinic. They don't have to like even interact with another person while they're there if they don't want to. Um, and that they can like sign in and check in on an app. Now before creating her design, Savannah conducted research and documented the STD testing process at multiple health service clinics like the one behind me here at SU. She says it's incredibly important for women to come together when creating ideas designed for them. Women coming together in design is really important, especially designing for like women's issues like this, because a lot of the systems like currently in place are designed just by men. So it doesn't really make sense for men to be designing women's health. SU student Tanya Joseph explains what she would think of this new approach. I feel like women would be more likely to take STD tests by themselves if they were given that option, but I do think that it is important to have a doctor or somebody there so that they can kind of tell them what those results mean. Savannah says her main goals for this new system are to be free and for women to actually use this form of self-testing. It's like through a feminist like design activism sort of lens and making things accessible is like also part of that activism. So. I think like seeing this project in like a public sector would be awesome. Savannah says she has always been interested in women's health care and that redesigning the system is more about education and information than it is about the testing itself. Reporting live from the studio, I'm Sarah Perks for Mornings on the Hill.
Thanks, Sarah. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, a Syracuse graduate returns to campus for Social Commerce Days. Now he's encouraging students to use social media as a platform for social change. Also coming up, how one activist group on campus is responding to the Me Too movement. Stay with us for those stories and much more here on Mornings on the Hill. Thanks for sticking with us. The Me Too movement has generated gender equality conversations across the nation over the last few months. Many in Hollywood, politics, and the media have shared their stories. Here on the Hill, the Me Too movement is a top priority for various campus organizations for students advocating sexual safety and empowerment better known as SASE. The movement can get lost among students. SASE President Katie Pataki thinks it's time for a change. This stuff does happen on campus. It's not just like a U2. It's like a Me Too here on campus. Pataki is one of the members of Chancellor Kent Sivarud's task force to combat sexual harassment at SU. Graduation is right around the corner for seniors, and here at Newhouse, the Career Development Center is often the first stop on the job hunt. The CDC hosts a job hunt seminar to coach students on how to network, narrow their search, and communicate effectively with potential employers. The office urges soon-to-be grads to take advantage of their support while they are on campus for advice on interviews and landing jobs. The W2O Center for the Social Commerce turned five years old this past week at Newhouse. To commemorate the occasion, the center's founder, Bill Weiss, returned to his alma mater to talk about the importance of social commerce in today's landscape. Social commerce is the practice of leveraging social media to persuade people to do something, buy something, or change something. Weiss says social media is essentially becoming media and it's having a large impact on our society. If anything proves the power, positive power, of what this, this medium can do, it's these kids coming out of the Florida school and what they're able to have done in what a matter of weeks. Weiss started the center five years ago with the goal of training students to understand the importance of social media and how to use it in the workplace. He says he's happy with the progress the center has made. In the next five years, he hopes to see more integrated curriculum where social commerce is taught across all majors. And with spring break just a few days away, of course, campus social media is buzzing with conversations surrounding everyone's plans for the week. Away. Our, our Omnea Abu Shanab is live in the studio with our Orange Social Update. Thank you, Jose and Sarah. You're absolutely right. Spring break is officially approaching and campus is slowly filtering out. So I did some social media surfing and I found a mix of reactions to the upcoming break. David here tweeted that he can't wait to spend spring break tanning on the frozen sand of Syracuse Beach. Um, I feel you on that, David. Syracuse is not the sunniest place, but hopefully you find something to do. And Alana here last minute decided that she's going to New York City. While not too far away, the Big Apple is probably a little bit warmer than it is over here. And then we have some humor here from the Black Sheep Syracuse, a comedy group who is often tweeting on Twitter. Um, they say spring break is four days away, and they included this funny photo of Squidward from SpongeBob. And I mean, I feel them. Spring break means the semester is almost over, and that means graduation is approaching, kind of in denial. And the last tweet here is from Jason, who says his professor extended his assignment till after spring break. And I am... Curious what you guys think, so tweet us at Mornings on the Hill. Do you think professors should, professors should give out assignments over school breaks? And that's all I have for you now. Be sure to stick around for the second half of the show. I'll be back with more Orange Social and you'll be hearing about transportation tips and updates. Thank you, Omnea. Looking for summer internships doesn't have to be a hassle if you get everything in order early. Our own Alexis Scott is live in studio this morning with Syracuse University Internship Coordinator Carol Hornstein to talk more. Thanks, you guys. I'm joined this morning by Ms. Hornstein to talk a little bit about how SU students can find and prepare for their summer internships. Thank you again for joining me this morning. Um, so just to kick off this conversation, can you tell me how can SU students actually start to prepare their internship and job search? Well, getting an internship is a process, much like getting a job. So you need to start with a resume. And that's the first step into a series of things that you need to do. Resume, cover letter, uh, networking for an opportunity, and then practice interviewing for that opportunity. And so can you tell me so, what are some of the resources that are available to students um, to use while they're here on campus? 
Well, each school and college has career and advising staff that can help students with this process. And they should visit those home schools first and foremost um, to see if there's drop-in times or office hours to get a quick check of their resume. Uh, we also have people at the central office located at um, room 235, Shine Student Center, and they can help you if you're struggling getting into your home school. And so can you tell me what are some big no-nos that you see that some students might run into while they're doing their interns internship search? I'm sorry. Well, if you have a resume, it should be one page long. Unless you have over 10 years experience, you should keep it to one page. And if you're offered a Skype or a phone interview, you should definitely dress fully from head to toe in a business uh, casual sort of way because you can be asked to stand up and you don't want to look as though that you're not prepared fully for the important you know, experience. Right, wow, that is <laughs> crazy. Um, and so can you tell me what is one of the biggest achievements that you feel you all have with helping students get ready for the greatest time of their life, just about? Well, they get to prepare to meet employers at our many career fairs. There is the recruitment collective coming up for the Newhouse students. Um, but there's career fairs, uh, different information sessions, workshops. Um, we offer a lot of things to help students prepare to uh, have an encounter with an employer. Well, thank you again for joining me, Ms. Carroll. I, I think we really appreciate it. I'm sure that we can all take something from what we were just talking about. Um, I'm Alexis Scott, live in the studio. Still, come here, still to come here on Mornings on the Hill, the latest Syracuse stage production inspires local authors to share their work. Stay with us for that story and more just ahead. Welcome back. Two local writers were in the spotlight this past weekend. Our own Christine Morin joins us live in studio with a story. That's right, Sarah and Jose. Syracuse Sage held a poetry and play event showcasing work of local writers. Let's take a look. Syracuse University alumna Marissa Joy Mims and SU creative writing professor Dana Spiota were in the spotlight this past weekend at Syracuse Stage. They weren't applauded for their acting, but for reading excerpts from their published work. Mims read from her essay titled, My Father. My father was drafted into the Army during Vietnam. He left briefly after his tour was over, but re-enlisted re after only finding work as a mover. While Professor Spiota read from her book, Stone Arabia. Nick had finally signed up for food stamps. He got $108 a month, which wouldn't come close to making up for the shifts he could no longer work. Each year, Syracuse Stage showcases the work of local authors whose writing shares themes with a stage production. The current show is A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hainsbury. Well, I, I'm sure you people must be it's a play about a family trying to find a better life in the south side of Chicago. Professor Spiota says there is a lot to be learned from this show. How uh, brave and audacious it was for her to write it when she did and to be the first woman with a play produced on Broadway, first black woman with a play produced on Broadway, um, is kind of a, a you know amazing piece of history as well. That's still very much about how we live now. Both authors shared how their own work correlated with this show. But, but thinking about the idea of a, of trying to to maintain yourself in the face of things that externally work against you. Well, my particular story is about my father, our family relations. A Raisin in the Sun is playing at the Syracuse stage throughout this Sunday. You can find both Mims and Professor Spiota's work at the SU Bookstore. Reporting live in studio, I'm Christine Morton for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks, Christine. Our colleagues Nicole and Alana join us now. They'll be taking over at 1030. But finally, this half hour, downtown Syracuse is kicking off St. Patrick's Day celebrations one week early. This Saturday, March 10th, people will be dressed in their Irish best for the Lucky Charm Bar Crawl. Blue Tusk, The Penny, and six others are participating in the event with exclusive offers and drink specials. The crawl starts at 2 p.m. at Empire Brewery. Tickets are $35 and all proceeds will be donated to the ALS Association to help fund research project projects. Syracuse joins a long list of other cities that will be hosting these annual bar crawls as part of the St. Patrick's Day festivities. Though it's the city of Orange, we'll let the color green slide this one time. 
Wow, so it looks like these people who are going to be staying here over break will have something fun to do for St. Patrick's Day, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of SantaCon a little bit, just for St. Patty's <laughs> Day, you know? Nobody will be in their Santa suits, but a couple people like the ones behind us will be dressed up as leprechauns and celebrating finding their pot of gold here, as one would say, in the Salt City. <laughs> Yeah, looks like it's going to be a great time. That will do, us, do it for us this morning. I'm Sarah Bonadies. Thanks for watching, Orange Nation. And I'm Jose Cuevas. Don't go away. Mornings on the Hill continues right after this break. Nicole and Alana and the rest of the team will be there with much more. Good Wednesday morning, Syracuse. I'm Nicole Dementri. Thanks for joining us for this half hour of Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Alana Selden. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about in our second half hour. Starts Saturday. DPS has tips on how you should prep your house and car before leaving for campus. Syracuse University's Counseling Center is taking action to respond to students' needs. We'll explain. And just who is behind the Krause College Bells? Our Allison Caliguire takes you inside the Secret Society. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. And our top story this half hour, people are still talking about this weekend's Academy Awards, which did not shy away from political or social issues. Our Odea Pincus joins us live with more about an idea to encourage diversity in Hollywood productions. Thanks guys. At the 90th Academy Awards, many stars were using their platform to speak out on social issues. Now Frances McDormand, who won Best Actress for her performance in three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, made a particular suggestion that got people talking. I went to find out more. This weekend at the Academy Awards, Frances McDormand won Best Actress for her role in three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. During her speech, she encouraged people to have inclusion riders in their contracts, leading many people to wonder what exactly that is. They can then say, you know, I want to include, to be more inclusive in my casting or in the crew that works on my project. So who can do this? When people do budgets, right, uh, there is something called above the line and below the line. Let's take a look at it this way. Above the line, you're going to have people like Jennifer Lawrence and Steven Spielberg, your lead actresses and your directors. Now, let's say I wanted to move to Hollywood to become a production assistant, I'd be below the line because I don't have that much leverage in my contract. Now, TRF professor Tula Goenka says that while this idea is exciting, it's not entirely new. I do know for a fact that Spike Lee, who I worked with in 1987 for the very first time, had, um, had it in his contract that his crew would be um, um, uh, uh, it, it had to do with race uh, and that he had he had to have a majority African-American crew on on his movies. But she and others say they are hopeful for the future of cinema. I think that with people on board like Frances McDormand and other A-listers, I think that that's a possibility. And reporting live, I'm Odea Pincus for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks, Odea. And for those who live off campus, this flyer may look familiar. The SU Department of Public Safety canvassed off-campus neighborhoods and left safety tips on doors before spring break to prevent some break-ins. DPS wants to remind students to lock all doors and windows, keep valuables like Xboxes and laptops out of plain sight, and invest in a light timer if the house will be empty. In cars, make sure all valuables are tucked away, including change in the cup holder. It may seem simple, but DPS says that many forget to take these precautions. DPS officer Cleveland McCurdy believes one conversation can change things. Who's leaving for break last? Last one out, make sure you lock everything up. McCurdy says in the event of a suspected break-in to call the police immediately and try not to touch anything due to possible fingerprints. Now DPS remains on duty during break and will be patrolling off-campus areas. 
And it's time for another check of our weather. I know downstate we're preparing for a huge snowstorm. Gianna Astorito is live to show us what to expect. Gianna. Thanks guys. It's pretty chilly out here, about 33 degrees. It's supposed to get a little colder due to some snow we're getting. But, one, but for once, Syracuse isn't going to be hit the hardest with the snow. There's a nor'easter and headed downstate towards Philadelphia. So if you're heading that way, make sure you plan accordingly. But let's check out what we've got going on for the rest of the week. Starting with today, it's generally overcast, as you can see, with some light snow showers with a high of 36 degrees and a low of 28. Expect a little more, but not too much snow developing in the east and the southeast as the day progresses. Tomorrow again, minor snow showers for central New York with a high of 34 degrees and a low of 28. The wind will be picking up, so make sure you're bundling up before going outside. Moving on to Friday, we're expecting one to three inches of snow here in Onondaga County. Temperatures are staying in the low to mid 30s with a high of 33 and a low of 27. Along with the winds, we're also likely to see some rain on Friday, so bring your umbrella just in case. Saturday temperatures are staying about the same with a high of 33 and a low of 25. We're expected to see some snow showers, but also have 60% chance of rain on Saturday as well. And Sunday we're reaching a high of 35 and a low of 23 stuck in the mid 30s. But no more snow for right now. It will be partly cloudy, so hopefully the sun will shine through to melt away some of the snow we're getting through the end of the week. And as you can see out here, it's some overcast. I can see some flurries coming down, but hopefully the snow holds off for a little bit. This has been your 1030 morning report. I'm Gianna Astorito. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you, Gianna, and it's certainly good to know that for all of the students that are traveling off campus in the next couple days. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's also midterm week for students all across campus, and it definitely can be a very stressful time. But not only because students are hard at work studying, there are many stresses that come along with college. So where can you go if you need help? Well, the Counseling Center is an option. This semester, the Counseling Center is extending their hours for the rest of the semester. And one student says it is much needed, especially during this time of the year. As spring is winding down, the pressure of knowing what I'm going to do after graduation, thinking about having to move out of my house, my lease ending, you know, pressures of the job world, having my family coming up, and you know, cap and gowns, all that stuff can be really overwhelming too. I can totally relate to that. Now the Counseling Center will be open Mondays and Thursdays until 7 p.m. and there will be two evening group therapy options. The Counseling Center is located at 200 Walnut Place. For more information on the center services, visit counselingcenter.syr.edu. For those that may need just a little study break in Bird Library, head over to the SU Abroad table on the first floor. SU Abroad Ambassadors will be at the library to answer any questions for prospective students. The Syracuse University Abroad program consistently ranks among the highest quality international programs in the country. With over 100 programs in 60 different countries, students are more than likely to find a program specifically geared for them. I think studying abroad is just really important for students to do because you do learn so much about yourself when you're abroad. Like I didn't have as much confidence as I did before going abroad. Um, and I feel like um, it helps me grow as a person. The deadline for the fall semester program is March 15th, and there will be open advising today in Tali 204 from 6 to 7 p.m. Drop in to have any questions answered. When people think about artificial intelligence, they may think of machines taking over the rules held by humans. However, an expert on AI visited campus to clear up many misconceptions and let students know how AI may change their future job prospects. Alberto Canal is the director of communications at IBM, where they are pioneering new artificial intelligence technologies and everything from medicine to sports. He says it's not man versus machine, but man with machine. For example, IBM's AI called Watson creates highlight reels at the U.S. Open. It does that by sort of taking uh, into account noise in the stadium, a player's physical reaction, a variety of different um, uh, KPIs, if you will, that it takes in and sort of then spits out this reel. Canal says AI will change the way work is done across all professions from the boardroom to the newsroom. He says the key for students entering the workforce is to be lifelong learners and remain aware of emerging technologies as they will continue to advance and shape the way the world works. As graduation approaches, many seniors are preparing portfolios, and for designers, that means a fashion show. Our Billy Owens joins us live and now with more on how a student at Syracuse has been prepping for years. 
Thanks, ladies. While most college students hit up their mall for their clothing, I had a chance to sit down with a VPA senior who chooses a different route. Ever since she was a little girl, Alon <laughs> Rose Stroy knew that creating fashion was in her future. At five years old, I was tearing up t-shirts. Uh, when I got into middle school, high school, I started bleaching stuff, bedazzling stuff. By being introduced to fashion at such a young age, Alon was able to develop her craft and learn from the people who are the closest to her. Um, then I realized I really liked fashion, and so I expressed that to my mom and my grandmother, and that's when they opened up to me and ex explained that they also used to be wanting to do fashion designers and how they could sew, and they showed me a lot of their work. And so I was just like, wow, like, I feel like this is in my blood. This is something I have to do. Alon wanted to dedicate her first clothing company, named Self Portrait, to the women who inspired her. But most importantly, she wanted to show people not only who she is, but where she comes from. A lot of things are inspired by um, just the aesthetic of my family being from D.C. and Detroit and me being from Atlanta. Like you see a lot of the mixture of those cultures, um, but you also see me into it where that comes into play of me using art and paint and pattern making and all that kind of stuff. Alon has gained the support from many of her friends here at Syracuse University. Ramona Young will not be walking in her fashion show this upcoming spring, but will be modeling in Alon's lookbook. Intense one, I'd say. It's been amazing to watch her um, grow into her artistic like self, I'd say, um, as we've like experienced different things in college, her classes. It's just been really awesome to watch her um, just like find really what she loves um, in her art. The Self Portrait Clothing Company will be shown at 7 p.m. on April 25th in the Jabberwocky Cafe. Reporting live for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Billy Owens. Still to come on Mornings on the Hill, find out how one local organization is teaming up with campus dining halls to reduce waste and feed the hungry in our community. Also coming up, the story of an SU athlete who balances his sport with fatherhood. Stay with us for those stories and much more here on Mornings on the Hill. Sticking with us now, have you ever wondered what happens to all that food left over by dining halls at the end of the day? Food Recovery Network's ESF and SU chapter found one way to help reduce food waste while helping the hungry and the local community. We go in as the dining hall is closing. We take all the prepared food that wasn't eaten and we package that food. We bring it to local shelters in the communities. The organization runs on volunteers who sign up to transport the food from dining halls to several local organizations like the Salvation Army. So far, the ESF and SU chapter have donated over 42,000 pounds of food to the hungry in the Salt City. If you would like to get involved, email the organization at frnesfsu at gmail.com. The Syracuse University administration has started a bi-weekly student media briefing. Student journalists are invited to attend to get updates about a variety of university events and issues here on campus. Now, the first meeting was led by the Associate Vice President for University Communications, Sarah Scalisi, and Donald Ivanovich, the Senior Vice President for Enrollment and Student Experience. We have to provide you, the members of the student media, a forum to receive timely and relevant information coming from discussions happening among our senior leaders and beyond. Scalisi says the administration's goal is to create a better dialogue to keep the campus community informed and to provide a way for the university to highlight what it thinks are key priorities on campus. The next media briefing is currently scheduled for Wednesday the 21st. In the wake of the Florida school shooting, student victims have become advocates, motivating students all over the nation to join the fight to make schools safer. SU has joined that list of schools supporting the initiative, and Monday night, the Student Association voted to provide funding for buses to go to downtown Syracuse, as well as Washington, D.C., for the March for Our Lives gun control rallies on March 24th. The Student Association issued a statement regarding the vote. Vice President Angie Patty says SA is still in the process of finalizing details, but quote, we are working hard to ensure that these opportunities 
occur. Although we will not voice our opinions about this issue as an organization, we've received enormous outreach from students about SA providing this opportunity. Now the statement continues, we're therefore ecstatic to be able to offer a way for students to voice what they believe is in because as representatives of the student body, it's our duty. Good morning, I'm Epiphany Catling with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. Syracuse took on their ACC rival Virginia on Sunday. The game got off to a slow start for the Orange, but they were able to pull off a win with one minute left in the game. The final score was 12 to 11. Senior Brendan Balmberry has been crucial for the Syracuse men's lacrosse team, but what people don't know is that he has another role. Brendan Balmberry began his college lacrosse career at the University of Denver. He went there to play with his best friend, and in 2015, they won a national championship. But things began to change. Anything I do, I'm doing it more than just myself now. You know, I have my son with me, and uh, you know, uh, that's the way I look at everything. It's not just me anymore. And Jagger is three years old. Brendan decided to come to Syracuse University to be closer to his son and the rest of his family. I think it's been awesome for me just to have my, you know, my family's new crowd uh, back when I was in Denver. You know, I didn't really have that luxury. The drive from Canada is only three hours. They usually make it every weekend. If not, uh, you know, they'll, they'll come for an extra day or two the next weekend. Brendan and Jagger lived with some of his teammates in Denver, and deciding to leave was a hard decision for him. Brendan had a big change in his life, and his teammates were there to support him every step of the way. They supported me in everything. Uh, they helped me whenever I needed. And, you know, uh, becoming a new father, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, uh, they didn't really know either. They kind of took it on as you know, kind of the, the uncle role. Brendan's teammates at Syracuse also embraced Jagger, making the transition a little easier. No way, dude. He's not shy whenever he's around the guys, you know, he'll come play video games with us or do whatever we're shooting around. I mean, he loves to hang out with all the guys and I think it's kind of cool for him. You know, see that he's grown up with uncles like Nate Solomon and Stephen Rafis. Jagger grew up around lacrosse and he picked up a few things. He's pretty good, I think. You know, he's just been surrounded by the game and surrounded by so many people that love the game for so long. And it's just, it's really come natural to him. This is Brendan's last year playing for Syracuse. So I definitely want to make the most of it and hopefully cap out for the national championship. That's the ultimate goal. Brendan and his team are 3-1 and one overall and 1-0 and in conference. Syracuse Nets home game is against Johns Hopkins on Saturday. Syracuse football had its first spring practice on Saturday. Quarterback Eric Dungey was back after missing the last three games of the 2017 season. In a press conference, Dungey didn't want to be compared to other Syracuse quarterbacks, but he did compare himself to Florida State's DeAndre Francois. Coach Dino Babers had this to say about it. You're a starting quarterback that's played two years in the ACC. You need to be not limiting yourself to the competition on your football team. I think it's healthy that he looks at himself as a national person, and I'm glad that he's compared himself to the other top people in the country. Coach Faber says his main goal for Dungy is to get him to finish a season healthy. Now, let's move on to the court. Last night, Syracuse beat Wake Forest in the first round of the ACC tournament at the Barclays Center. Freshman Merrick Dolishai had a breakout game, scoring a career high of 20 points. Tonight, Syracuse will have a rematch against UNC. The Orange recently lost to the Tar Heels by four points. Tip-off for this game is at 9 p.m. We all search for a meaning and purpose in life, and at Liverpool High School, one former Syracuse basketball player has found his purpose, but it's not where he initially looked. Syrac I mean, Chris Vinson has a special report for Mornings on the Hill. It's game time here at Liverpool High School, which means Ryan Blackwell has just settled into his comfort zone. In just his second year as head coach, Blackwell has his Warriors ranked number four in all of New York. The team's noticeable chemistry flows from its head coach's confident, easygoing demeanor. But on Blackwell's team, if you don't perform... He'll give you that look. He'll give you that stare down. What do you mean? What's that? Like, you just stare you down, yeah. And what does that mean? Start, better start playing. 
wrap around, you'll be wide open. Coach Blackwell learned how to dish out the tough love in Japan as a player and coach for the Sendai 89ers. Blackwell spent 10 years playing overseas after starting for three seasons at Syracuse University in the late 90s. I want somebody to push me and I want to know that they're in my corner. Good job, good job. It's this type of support that's changed the lives of his players. It's helped my attitude get better on and off the court. And the type of support he wishes he had overseas. I kind of, I guess maybe didn't take it as serious as I used to when I was younger. So I was like, well, either I'm going to go into the corporate world, do something back home, or get into coaching. I think that was a great decision on my part. Now Blackwell's found a home where he can have an even bigger impact off a court than he could ever have on one. I enjoy basketball, obviously. I enjoy sports, but I enjoy mentoring these kids, um, especially these kids at this age. Are, they're emotional. Um, they have a lot, a lot of things going on, and, and it's a crazy world out there, and just trying to steer them in the right direction is great. Reporting for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Chris Venzen. That's your sports update. I'm Epiphany Catling. Still more to come here on Mornings on the Hill. Our Allison Caliguire has an inside look at the people behind the music you hear coming from Charles College. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, have you ever been walking across campus and all of a sudden you hear One Direction or the Beatles? I know I have. You know what? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> the people responsible are a group called the Chime Masters. And our Allison Cal Caliguire spoke with a senior in the organization, and she joins us now with the story. Allison? That's right, uh, Nicole and Alana. The Chime Masters are the ones responsible for the music you hear coming from the Krauss Bell Tower. The organization keeps its members a secret. So, as you're about to see, I spoke with one Chime Master, but she asked that I not show her face or use her name. You can hear the bells from a mile away, but few people have the privilege of ringing them. As a freshman, she was invited to join the Chime Masters. Oh my gosh, the first time I walked in, I was like, what is this place? The first time she chimed, it wasn't exactly perfect. At that time, I didn't even know how to read treble clef. But with practice, she's gotten better. People have been ringing the bells for years. In the chamber below the bells, you can even see where someone signed the wall in 1924. The senior I spoke with says things weren't always quite as organized as they are now. People chimed whenever they wanted. It was just, it was a wreck. Six years ago, they laid out some ground rules. One being that you can't just invite your friends to be a chime master. People had a really hard time pulling aside their friends saying, hey, you gotta stop doing this. Chime masters also limit how frequently they chime during the week and don't chime at all during finals. But when it's their turn to ring the bells, they're free to play whatever music they want. You know, it's expressing yourself, expressing how you're feeling that day. And they've got hundreds of songs to choose from. We have a lot of Beatles songs. <laughs> we have a lot of Beatles songs. But her favorite song to play is Can't Help Falling in Love by Elvis Presley. God, I think it just sounds so beautiful on the chimes. She says the mystery of who is ringing the bells is part of why she loves being a chime master. You don't know who's playing, but they, they're playing, um, yesterday by the Beatles, so maybe they feel the same way as you because you just got broken up with. Now I'm sure that many of you have songs you'd like to hear played on campus. The Chime Master I spoke with told me that they are now accepting submissions, so look out for them on Twitter and Instagram, and maybe you'll hear your favorite song coming from the Bell Tower. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Allison Caliguire. Now let's get an update about what's trending on campus from Anea over at the Monitor. Thanks, Allison. Hello again, everyone. I'm Amnea Bushnab, and I'm back with your second Orange Social update. Now, for all of you traveling this week, you're going to want to be on the lookout for delays and cancellations. One of my favorite ways to do that, of course, is Twitter. A lot of college students travel by bus or plane, so I followed along with some major airports and bus lines to see what has, ha what has been happening because of the big nor'easter. John F. Kennedy Airport tweeted that the nor'easter is causing a lot of delays and that they urge, urge travelers to call ahead of time to see if their flight has been canceled or delayed. And Newark similarly tweeted that more than 550 flights scheduled for today alone have been canceled due to the weather. And Megabus is saying for ticket holders to check their emails in case that there are any changes to their trips. And SA here at Syracuse University is offering a shuttle to and from the airport and regional transportation center. So that's all I have for you today. Be sure to stay on social media. Back to you ladies at the couch. 
Thank you so much for that, Amnea. And that's going to do it for us this Wednesday morning. I'm Nicole Dementry. Make sure to follow us on all social media. Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Alana Selden. Thanks for watching Orange Nation. Have a great spring break, and we'll see you right back here in two weeks, live at 10 a.m. right here on OTN.